There we go. All right. So here we go. Um, hi, everybody. I am really glad to see you. I have talked to some of you and not seen you. So that's cool to put some faces with things. Um, I'm Terry Stewart, the religious coordinator for Echo Glen. I, uh, my undergraduate degree is in criminal justice, and I just never left. I just never left. As I went through seminary and everything, I just stayed in prisons, hung out in prisons and detention centers for 21 years now. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I've been a spiritual director at uh, the women's prison, volunteer at Monroe, then uh, at King County, and of course, Echo One. And I've been across to other places, but those are the ones I've been really immersed at. So today's um, uh, training is strictly on JRA's policy, religious policy 4.11, which after we're done, if you want to, you can find on the internet, just do Washington religious policy 4.11, and you'll find it. Um, and you can download it yourself. And it is uh, just the an updated policy for all juvenile rehabilitation JR facilities um, so that everybody's on the same page. And again, I referred to earlier before I turned the recording on that they have like changed language from chaplain to religious coordinator, that there might've been some lawsuits involved. One of them led to this change in policy and creating a working group that came together to uh, really create this new policy. And I was privileged to be on that working group. And I was one of the few people that was on the working group that was a religious person and actually was at the facilities. So uh, I, I would, yeah, so I had a different kind of point of view than a lot of people that were just like, no, we need to change the policy. We also need to make it so it works, right? So hopefully we have done that. So I have a PowerPoint presentation, and I don't know if you know that you can do like a split screen on Zoom after I get it going so that you can have the PowerPoint on one side and the person speaking on one side, and you're not just like looking at a PowerPoint and not ever seeing a person, which I know for me is I like to see the people because people are great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here we go. Thank you. Thank you again for joining. Let's see. It's if I can manage to do this properly. Uh, share screen. that button. So uh, for a long time, I was doing this at church every Sunday, and I definitely had moments where I got uh, unsynchronized from my PowerPoint presentation to my speaking because I would forget to forward the button, even though I was talking. So uh, if I become unsynchronized, please do speak up and I will fix that really quick. So uh, this is JRA policy 411 for religious volunteers with an S on it, even though I didn't type the S. I put this kind of background on there because this is our roadmap. Okay. So what we're gonna go over is the purpose and scope of the policy, definitions, changes, legalities, what, how the youth access religious and spiritual activities, what religious and spiritual expression looks like, positive consent model, responsibilities are really that's like the hierarchical structure community volunteers and community facility policy because some of us actually go to the community facilities also and the same policy covers those places as covers echo glenn and then uh if you you might encounter youth that have a difficulty so being able to tell them how they would file a complaint would not be a bad thing it's all covered under that policy so the purpose and scope is to provide guidance and expectations on supporting youth with appropriate resources, access and opportunities to explore and participate in spiritual activities or religious activities and the requirements of their faith as a constitutionally protected right. 
all staff, contractors, volunteers, and interns working in or for JR are responsible for reviewing and complying with these policies. Okay. So if you have any questions, you can either hold it till the end or ask as we go through. I'm open to either. Just know if you ask as we're going through, I might get sidetracked. Uh, I wanted to go through some definitions that they use so that we're all on the same page before we get there. So they consider a belief system to be something that is more like a formalized religious belief system that has principles and tenets or doctrine, we might say, that uh, a religion is the system that has that belief system, the values, practices, and rituals in it. Religious activities are like those rituals, the practices, traditions, services. Uh, some have special diets and culturally related practices. Like mon uh, this week is Rosh Hashanah for our Jewish friends. And we do have a Jewish youth on campus. So we uh, distributed challah bread to all the cottages and apples and honey because the tradition is to dip your challah and apples into honey as a celebration of and hope for a sweeter new year. So, which is a beautiful thing and everybody can kind of participate that to learn cross-culturally about each other. And then our Jewish youth feel like they're being taken care of also. The religious coordinator is the person who is designated as the administrator who coordinates all the things about religion and spirituality at each JR location. Religious practices are the exercise of their religion, whether or not such exercise is compelled by or central to a system of religious belief. So what they're saying is a youth could have a religious practice that is not necessarily part of a, a formalized doctrinal system of belief. So that's those kind of things like can often get left off to the side that we need to be careful of. It includes like religious symbols, worship, religious services, study, classes, ceremonies, prayer, meditation. Um, we have rosaries on campus. I have a bunch of them uh, that uh, Joe Cotton with the Archdiocese of Seattle bought and we have them on campus, have bunches of Bibles and studies and Qurans and everything that you need, uh, hopefully. If there are things that you find that you need, then just ask and we have budget because I, I told Echo Glenn I wasn't gonna do it unless they gave us a budget to buy the things we need. So, if you need something, you don't have to spend your own money. In. Cool? Cool. Yes. A uh, religious specialist is any formal leader of a religion or spiritual ceremony. So, pastors, uh, rabbis, imams, those kind of people that are formal uh, leaders. It could be nuns or monks, right? It could be many type of people. Um, that provide particular religious teachings and have been recognized from their community as a being in a specialized uh, leadership role. Whereas a re religious volunteer is any person who is volunteering in a religious or spiritual program. Spiritual is seeking within to find meaning or purpose, creating harmony in the mind, spirit, and soul, and connecting to the moment, self, others, nature, or a higher power. Those are JR's definitions, which I'm, I, I'm like, religion should be spiritual, but hopefully it is. So the things that are specifically changed are that this is the first time that access to religious activities is recognized by JR as a protected right. So we can just hold that within for just a minute. <laughs> Right. Um, also, they because now they're recognizing that re restricting youth partic participation is really limited to only safety or security concerns, and they have to document it, and it has to be the most, the least restrictive limitation put on the youth. Like if they're denied going to church, they need to have a good reason why. 
right? I mean, we're in COVID time. So right now, the main reason not all the kids get to go to uh, participate in religious stuff is usually because there's too many youth in one spot because they still need to maintain social distancing. So, uh, but once that's over, if we ever get to a point in life where we are kind of normally operating, then it needs, then, Echo Glenn, JR, needs to operate in a way that is the least restrictive for the youth to be able to practice their religious uh, activities. Terry? Yes? Could I ask a question about that? Sure. Since I come from a field that was highly litigated, mm -hmm. of special education, and the terminology mm -hmm. of least restrictive is coming out of that federal law. Mm -hmm. um, so if restrictions are placed, do we have a role in advocating for an, a, an I want to say, an accommodation or modification? Um, in the moment, I would say that, uh, it, so I'm going to say it depends. So in the moment, like if it's going to a church service, which is different, a different thing than like doing a Bible study in the cottage, Right. Mm -hmm. So in the moment, if it's going to like a church service and they're saying person can't go because there's they're, they're uh, they got in trouble at dinner time and they were not cooperative. Right. Um, in that moment, it's not if they're going it do, so this is where it depends if they're going to church service it may not be possible to raise the issue up high enough to get it handled in time for a church service to happen but right. in the moment if you have a good enough relationship with staff then asking them it, is this really the the best that we can do but you yeah, have it's, it's a fine line it's yeah, a fine I'm line and to give you, you an example yeah. of, of how I would apply that would be that if they're unable to go to a church service, can I deliver a, 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 a personal individual uh, liturgy with them in the cottage? Um, I understand the restrictions on safety and things like that. Yep, but, yep. you know, I, I think it, it would it be understood to think that it, that's appropriate for me to ask, or am I going to get into some kind of like pushback? I, I don't <laughs> want to do that. So, right. I'm just trying to understand the parameters of yes. that advocacy, if you will. Yeah, I think that that would be appropriate. Like, I would say that that's appropriate, right? Um, because they, for example, we have a young person on campus right now who is Mormon, who has been uh, just in tons of trouble since he got there, right? But that doesn't mean he doesn't have a right to... Um, so I've been trying to hook them up with a, another Mormon volunteer, right, to bring that together so that they can work together. Mm -hmm. And so working with the staff so that I can have a private religious conversation where they're not letting him have private conversations with anybody right now. Right. We got to a place where we could make that happen. And the staff were fine with it right but it really a lot of it depend depended on like my approach i think being humble right and deferential kind all of the things that we are as good people right <laughs> that he, we hope to be as our best selves being our best selves with the staff will help us make those um blockades kind of melt away right. and then yeah. A lot of staff actually have sympathy in that situation too, and they would want you to be able to work with the particular youth, I think. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the staff that I worked with were very supportive. So uh, mm -hmm. that was less of an issue. Now you talk about documenting. Uh, does that include documenting the least restrictive option that's, agreed to? Yeah, or that's, that's Echo's job. That's Echo's job. The documentation is Echo's job. If you start to sense a pattern, then we can ask for the documentation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we're not documenting Echo's behavior or their staff's behavior. We will just do our jobs as religious volunteers and then advocate the, to our best of our ability with humility, you know, on behalf of all the youth that we are with. Okay. Thank right? you.
So the new law, of Here course, grows. Hmm? Yes. Oh, this is Kane. I just had a question, but I can ask it later. I want to go on now. Oh, you can. You can ask. Okay. My my question is: is the policy right now is that there's like two going from each cottage because of lack of staff? And the question I have is: it possible? say when we get a Catholic priest to come and do a mass that we can get the kids that are actually Catholics to be able to come, not maybe someone else who just wants to get out and see the other kids that are there. Yes. Uh, um, so the same thing happened for our, our Muslims youth because we had an imam who was coming in. Um, and at first there was yeah, so the same thing happened with regard to Muslim youth. There was a lot of kids that are not a lot, but a few kids were curious and they started taking precedent over the actual Muslim youth. And I'm like, no, we need the Muslim youth to have priority. It's their actual practice, right? It's great that they're curious. I want them to learn intercultural respect for one another, but it is the Muslims youth's practice. So I the same would apply for Roman Catholic youth, that it is their it's their actual practice. Uh, and in this case, since it's restricted, then the Roman Catholic youth should get priority over uh, Protestant youth that would want to attend. Not that I don't want them to attend, but at this time, it is a, it's a hard, um, a harder situation. Okay, that's good to know, thank you. Okay. So the, uh, legality is that, of course, religious freedom rests on the Constitution. So I put a picture of our founding documents on here. Um, and in the policy, it says that youth may exercise this right without undue influence from volunteer staff or family while in JR facilities. So people are not allowed to interfere with the youth's practice, just anybody. They will uh, try to protect them. So accessing religious and spiritual activities. So JR is supposed to make every reasonable effort to enable all youth the opportunity to express their right of religious practice. It's within the law to restrict religious activities when there is a compelling interest to do so, including but not limited to legitimate security and operational considerations such as safety and health or limitations of resources. And the imposed limitation is the least restrictive means of addressing the compelling interest. So that's word for word what the policy is, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, when we think about safety and health right now, we can think of that like COVID restrictions, right? And only to youth being able to go to church at a time, um, that kind of thing. But that hopefully will not always be there. <laughs> Pray, <laughs> right? Then the religious and spiritual expression. So there's practicing and then there's what the expression that youth may participate in the religious and spiritual services and counseling on a voluntary basis. So they can't be compelled to go. Staff will provide each youth the opportunity to participate in the practices and activities as they are available. Youth are able to express their religion through the appropriate clothing according to their traditions head coverings and whatnot, um, rosaries, uh, but those items, uh, some of those items need to stay in their room. Rosaries are one of those items that need to stay in their room because um, there's, there's a security risk because it is basically, you know, a rope that can be used in uh, some different ways than we intended. So uh, that kind of thing. So they can keep them in their room. They're not allowed to take them out. Um, some youth have head coverings according to their tradition. They can own and use them unless it is a deemed an imminent security threat. What I think is super interesting is the difference between state and county with what they deem as a security threat when it comes to um, items of religious expression because county is much more restrictive than Echo Glen, JRA, which to me is ironic. <laughs> All right. 
JR's moved to what we call a positive consent model. And I think in our culture, we've had a lot of conversations about consent, what it means in relationships. And a positive consent model means kind of like an enthusiastic yes, right? So JR is saying a positive consent model is that the youth invites the conversation, that the adults are not putting their conversations onto the youth and requiring the youth to say no because of the power imbalance between an adult and a youth, whether that adult is a volunteer or a staff person, that it needs to be the youth inviting it. Now, there are some assumptions with like Bible study and uh, uh, church things that the youth are going to, that you're going, they're going to talk about religion, period, right? But if you're doing a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's up to the youth to bring it up. Um, it, does mean so it doesn't mean that you can't talk about your own religious experiences though so if you're talking to a youth and they're like stressed out and they're like uh you you know what what helps you to be calm right they might ask that question or you might be able to say as they're stressing out like one thing that keeps me calm is being able to pray and i pray this way right so you're making I statements about what helps you. You're not telling the youth that this is what they need to do and it will, that it is a solution for them, but is it an opening and an invitation? Does that uh, make sense? Because this can be the hardest part for people. All right. All right. So uh, dialogue about beliefs, religion, or faith must never be unwanted forceful or serve an attempt to persuade or convert, ridicule or question the youth's religious or spiritual beliefs. There's a lot of religious bullying that happens within juvenile detention systems. Uh, we see it, uh, especially on, uh, amongst the smaller religious groups that are on campus. And so this is one way of trying to squash that. And staff and volunteers participate in the, the religious bullying just as much as the youth do to one another. And it's not cool. Please don't. <laughs> right. So the kind of flow of responsibilities at Echo Glen is superintendent. Right now is Amy Turry, um, associate superintendent, which is blank because I don't know who that is right now. Um, volunteer program coordinators, Nick Kushner right now. Uh, he is the program co coordinator for all the volunteer programming, not just religious programming. So then I'm the religious coordinator and I would talk to Nick about things. The, and then some faith communities have individual faith community oversight. Like I think Susan just joined us. So KCYC is their organization. And I think they work together as a unit um, to do their jobs. The Roman Catholic Church kind of is Jojo Bromfield uh, and Joe Cotton. So they work together to kind of organize those groups. And so they're uh, East Side Chapel, I think you all work together to organize your people, right? So some groups are uh, have a communal oversight kind of cooperative thing happening so that they're not just coming willy-nilly. Then there's just individual people that come willy-nilly and we like that too. <laughs> I'm down for the willy-nilly volunteers, right? So that's kind of the uh, flow um, right now until we get a little bit more organized and Nick gets everything underneath of his feet. We, I want the scheduling stuff to go up to me and then I will provide one list to Nick because right now, um, yeah, Tammy just dumped all that stuff on him starting uh, yesterday when somebody sent a note to her and then she's just like forwarding everything to Nick and Nick is like, oh my God, right? So, uh, I'm going to just keep a list every day of every request and then just send one request so that he is not so overwhelmed as he's going through this adjustment. And as we're all learning this new way of doing things. The good news is now I have access to the program calendar. So I can see, uh, I can tell you a little bit better just to begin with, like what are bad times to come in? Because I can look at the program calendar. There we go. Next one. There we go. 
So community religious volunteers, as I referenced earlier, they kind of did away with the language, legally did away with the language of chaplains um, because of the kind of legal action. And the legal action grew out of experiences that the tribes, the Confederated Tribes of uh, Washington had. Um, they came together and brought one big lawsuit against uh, Washington State, um, DOC and JRA because they're uh, not being able to practice their religions and or their spiritual practices. And then out of that grew kind of this change in language that came in, I think, 2018 in the legislature from the language of chaplain to religious coordinator and religious volunteer, because the language of chaplain is very uncomfortable for some kind of communities that have been like forcefully converted. Uh, and yeah, so that reason, for that reason, we're kind of, uh, not using the word chaplains as much so that we too do not get sued. Okay, so religious volunteers and the religious specialist must complete and pass background checks and you all know how to, you all know that. Um, and then there's other policies that go over that and volunteers and religious specialists who pass the background check and meet all policy and training requirements will be allowed to visit JR facilities, lead or participate in religious and spiritual activities, do spiritual counseling with youth or just counseling with youth, transport in community facilities. If you complete the training for driving, you can transport youth in community facilities to religious and spiritual services in the community, according to policy 5.4. Um, I used to drive kids from the Woodenville group home to all kinds of activities. We'd go bowling, we'd go hiking, all kinds of things. I don't have time to do that anymore. Somebody else should do that. We should have a volunteer do that. Anyway, but it, what we think is really important because uh, the, the staffing at the group homes especially is very limited is if there's a concerted effort by churches in the areas to reach out to group homes and to provide transportation for youth to get from there to the church. That's cool. Carrie, so, yes. Carrie, just a mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. For those of us who have previously served as volunteers and have passed background checks, does this activate a whole new step of going all the way through the process again. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Every <laughs> single facility, you have to pass a different background check. I mean, it's the same background check with the same background people, but it's still, because they contracted out to one company. Anyway. No, no I understand yeah. that. I'm not sure you understood my question. Oh, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know that there's different provisions in different uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. The question is, I've served at Echo Glen, do I now need to go back through the background check and all the other requirements? I don't oh. have a problem with it. I'm At just Echo saying, Glenn? Yeah. No. no. Okay. Okay. I just I just wanted to make sure at, in terms of what the implications were. I mean, I'm willing to do it. It's just a matter of the, the pragmatics of it. So yep. No, okay. that's just requirements for new um, people coming on board and I am not sure what the expiration time is. Like at right. King County, we have a two, every two years we have to do it. Um, and uh, logically, it would make sense to me that Echo Glen would have something like that start at some point in life. Um, and I do believe they do have some expiration because some of the people that have been away from uh, because of COVID are expiring and having to re-up. So I right. just don't okay. know the length of time of what that is. It okay. could be two years, it could be five years. Somewhere between two and five. So, all right. So community, uh, community facility policy for the sake of our people that work in volunteering both. Um, youth may request to attend a religious or spiritual services in their community. Each community facility needs to determine a process for supporting youth to participate in religious services, and youth should be given equal opportunity to attend religious or spiritual services. They have the same um, restrictions as like the larger JR facilities, which is safety and security concerns, and that uh, the facility should be documenting it. If they're saying no to a youth, they need to document. 
So, um, and if the if they don't have enough for all the youth to go or something like that, then they need to figure out a way to rotate the youth so that because uh, the priority of a constitutionally protected right takes uh, precedence over like that's too much work. We don't want to do it, right? <laughs> that is not that's a non-starter. So as you're interacting with youth, they might have a, a complaint about how they're being treated with regard to their religious or spiritual activities within the facility. They can handle uh, that using the same complaint process that they would use for anything else. I don't expect you to memorize it is DCYF form 20-234, but if you so choose to memorize that, go for it. And that is the entire policy. So it's open for questions and conversations. I'm going to stop sharing for a while. Well done. Thank you. I'm hoping to get you through it quickly. <laughs> but it's a, uh, yeah, it's easier to, for me to talk it through than just to like have you all read it. and the kind of nuances of how you can talk about your faith without um, like without being uh, proselytizing is like really sitting in your I statements and uh, saying this is what helps yourself without pushing it on to someone else. Yeah. yeah, those kind of things. It makes sense. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I have one question. Okay. Uh, what's the uh, regulation bringing Bible or uh, religious books? Is there anything that we, we need to watch out? Yeah, we have, I have a uh, hundred Bibles at least on campus in my office of different kinds. Um, so if you need a Bible or some Bibles delivered to people, I am happy to make those deliveries on your behalf, or you can ask, uh, the staff to let you into classroom 14 and get what you need out of the room. I am not, uh, at King County, they used to lock all the Bibles up behind a lock. And I was just like, no, I don't care if anybody steals a Bible you can take the lock off, right? So take all the Bibles you need. I'm happy with that. So classroom 14. Classroom 14. Okay, so if I ask the front desk, I will be able to access that or? Yeah, security or the, yeah, the security people should be able to meet you at classroom 14 and let you into the room. I can't tell you like if it'll take five minutes or 10 minutes, but they have, I mean, I have a key to the room now. Um, it's my office in air quotes because it doesn't look very officey, but it is, uh, yeah, they have always been responsive pretty quickly to get me into the room before I had a key. How about other reading materials? There are piles of devotionals in there. Um, so, yeah, it, okay. the kind of, um, so there are piles of devotionals in there, and yet there still might be something that you want to bring in. So the, the kind of rule of thumb for bringing items in is if it is required or needed for their spiritual or religious activity, then you just make the case that it is required or needed for their religious or spiritual expression, right, as constitutionally protected by the United States of America, right? So that you can make that case and or you say, I am giving this to the cottage as long as Michael gets to read it first. Okay. Thank Which you. is what I do a lot of times instead of trying to argue my way through things. So it's like, this is a gift for the cottage. Michael gets it first. Then you all can pass it around. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder if I missed something there. Are you saying that you, we, we don't give Bibles directly to a youth? No, you can. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I, I yeah, so you, it's just that you don't have to like buy some and bring it in. There's some right. there on campus and or because uh, there's a new graphic um, Bible published by Tyndale right now that uh, the kids really like, but it's pretty pricey. So um, 
I, and, but the advantage is under a 501c3, I can buy it and I don't have to pay taxes on it. So at least I get that tax break. Um, so I've been trying to get those. I cannot uh, buy them quick enough, actually, to keep, get them. The kids really like them. So it was, it's uh, drawn, the, it, it, the Bible is drawn by the same people that do Marvel comics. So it's really astoundingly well done. Cool. And it's cool looking and, you know, kids and cool is because <laughs> I'm not cool looking. So there you go. <laughs> Gary, I've been bringing Bibles in with my own money for six years now. It's awful nice to know that there are some. Yeah. Some there. Yeah. Uh, I think that's where the the it kind of fell down with these social workers overseeing it because the they've had bibles on campus cases of bibles on campus sitting in their storage in the rec room rec area so they were probably there and so i i'm sorry that you had to spend your money i'm just mm. you know but i cleaned out the whole room and found all the good things and threw the bad things away <laughs> They had some really old, old, old stuff. Like they had one uh, devotional that had a picture of a noose on the front. And I'm like, no, I don't want pictures of nooses running around campus. This is not happening. So yeah, those kind of things. So I have a question. Okay. Um, this is news to me about that uh, the new what you shared about chaplains about that title, and so I didn't know that. <laughs> and okay. I've always identified myself as a chaplain, so I'm happy to learn the new language. Um, but you know, sometimes when I go into a cottage where I'm not working with a specific youth, or I ask for a particular youth who I heard I should visit with. I would say um, I'm the chaplain. So you're suggesting I say, now, uh, what uh, are you suggesting? <laughs> I'm uh, saying in everything that's written, it's going to say religious volunteer, religious okay. coordinator, coordinator, and religious specialist. Um, okay. You come from your faith community, and in your faith community, you are a chaplain. Okay. Okay. So you can say that. Is yes. Written. So the written policies across uh, JRA are going to be the, the more broader language, but okay. people that come from their faith community, it's important that you stand in your tradition and claim it and be the name chaplain. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I, follow, I follow Susan because I'm with KCYC too. And so mm -hmm. that was, thank you for clarifying that, Susan. Yeah. That was that was helpful. Yeah. 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 And also just knowing, can we just go and peruse to see in classroom 14 of what there is available to be able to give? Because I, like other people, just spent my own money in bringing, you know, Bibles and other, other devotions to kids. Yeah, for sure. So um, the so it's a classroom and it's shared between me and somebody who has yet to actually appear. So half of the room is mine and the other half is hers. Mine, you can okay. tell what half is mine because books are everywhere. But um, it's kind of, their Bibles are on the top shelf and devotionals are on the bottom left. So if you go into classroom 14, Bibles on the top shelf, devotionals okay. bottom left. Terry, do you know, does, every cottage does every library in the cottage have one of these tyndale graphic bibles not yet not yet that's your goal yeah i i do want to get them for the youth that want them and so far they just every if i give them to one youth in the cottage everybody wants one so uh i'm just going oh. going through a case a month so I've only gotten a couple cottages covered, so I'm working on it. They're pretty pricey. Um, also, yeah, they're pretty pricey. So, and then the staff want them. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So, I see. Oh, if you have uh, churches that want to buy them and donate a case, then I'm done with that too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So pricey being what in, in terms of, of for you, Terry? Um, so a case of 12, I, if I remember correctly, is probably $150. They're a hardback. They are very high quality. Yeah. So $10 a piece. Something like oh, that, probably. if I remember. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, something. Yeah. But I, again, the more you buy at once, the bigger your discount is. And then not having to pay taxes is very helpful. So, right. And I did right. go through the process to get the tax free thing um, with them, which was super fun. I love to do that kind of paperwork. <laughs> well, the parishes can order books in bulk and receive reduction. So, uh, you know, I, I, the reason I'm asking is I wonder if we get it at a better price. Yeah, maybe. Um, so, you know, it's just exploring what that might be and then, and then how we work that out. Um, same thing with Joe. I mean, he, yeah. he may at the archdiocesan level be able to negotiate a price that um, makes it more accessible. Yeah. And, and even if we had to do a, you know, a funding drive, if you will, uh, through the parishes to support it. I mean, it's, it would be it's great. a simple way that people can uh, engage with prison ministry, if you will. Yep. I'm okay. happy to let other people spend money because <laughs> I'm ultimately very cheap. <laughs> so. Yeah, but the, um, and I've just been working straight with Tyndale Publishing. So cutting out any middle middle people. Um, and just to let everybody know, the COVID uh, proof of vaccination thingy is going to be in effect on October 18th. For sure, uh, the staff are gathering their proofs of vaccination right now. They expect that 10% of their staff will quit rather than uh, yeah. be vaccinated. Oh, wow. um, so it's going to be tense. And they don't know exactly how they're going to have the volunteers provide their proof of vaccination, but just to let you know that that is on the radar. Wow. Yeah. So. Are there volunteers at Echo Glen today? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I'm talking with Jojo either the end of this week or the beginning of next week. Um, and we will be talking about getting the Roman Catholic volunteers back on campus as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. I understand that they are in the process of being cleared. A, a priest has applied and it's just taken a long time to get them through the system. Uh, to get what Jojo through the system? What, what, or, what are you referring to, Kay? Well, I'm well. Getting a priest to come and say mass wow. is is they've been working on it at the diocese, but he had to get he didn't have clearance to come. In well, to echo the first time he can come in, he doesn't need to be cleared. So uh, that would get him in in October. So then he just he will have all the way to November to get cleared. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So the so the first time he comes in. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, I'll because mass, I would really like to get started back up. We do have a lot of Roman Catholic people. Well, the kids really want it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so 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 now now what you said is the first time he comes in. So once a year. A volunteer can come in once a year and they don't need to be cleared if they're coming in only once a year. Any more mm -hmm. frequent than that, they need to be cleared. Oh, okay. My son does music. He comes about once every two years. He never been cleared. So. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Well, so he could come once, so that, that's good. The so priest that was coming, is in a different position now so yeah how the yeah, uncleared uh volunteer can come in I and mean, they just show up or do they have to tell somebody they uh there's a whole process so if you have an uncleared volunteer 
that's coming for a program, then we need to know about five days before they're coming. We need to know their full name and they need to bring a state issued ID. They need to be escorted at all times, that kind of thing. Escorted by the staff. Uh, uh, so typically they're coming for a larger program like a church service. So there's always staff present. Um, I've not experienced them coming for anything smaller than uh, that kind of event. So escorted means uh, from the, uh, the check-in desk, front desk to the cottage included or inside of the cottage? Uh, you would be with them at all times. They would never be alone with a youth period, I think is what it is. I have a unrelated question. Uh, just, I know a while back, there was an incident between two girls mm -hmm. and one was hospitalized. Mm -hmm. um, I know you can't get into specifics, but um, can, can you, Tell us if that girl is okay. Yep, she's okay. She's back. She's a very jovial young lady, and she is a happy camper to be alive. Okay. And back. Good. That's good news. Yeah, she's a smiley person, so it's just I'm delighted to see her back. I've known yeah. her also since uh, before she had a criminal record. So. Whoa. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah. Well, glad she's bouncing back. Yeah. Sounds like it's tough. Yeah. yeah. Yep. There's some tough things. And uh, since a lot of you haven't been on campus since pre COVID, I think one of the things that have changed. So, Susan and Kango and me, I think, are the only ones that have been on campus. One of the things that has changed I've been uh, on is campus. oh, Lori has also. Yes. One of the things and I have been too. Okay, well then most of us have been. But for those who haven't, the one of the things that has actually changed is because of the state law that passed a couple of years ago that extends um, the age of being the age of adolescence up to the age of 25 and allows the youth between 18 and 25 to be incarcerated at a juvenile facility rather than at an adult DOC facility is that we have young adults, I call them juvenile adults because I really can't think of what a proper name is for that. So juvenile adults that are in that age group sentenced by DOC at the JR uh, facility. So Yakima is the cottage where they go to, which has mostly young women in it, but it has one young man in it. Um, and they're, they're young adults, 18 to 25. And it's a, a little bit of a different category of things that they do, things that they're open to. Like they're just, uh, it's a maturity level. And you got 13 years old and 23 year old in, buildings right next to each other so so the youngest um, is 14 right now 13 13 i believe yeah she's 13 she was younger than that when she came she was yeah yep and the other thing now we have is if you need to know when youth are leaving i have access to their case notes so i can look that stuff up that doesn't, they don't typically put in there like if they're gonna be transferred to one of the group homes. So it's, I haven't found that in there in an accurate way yet. So it's just the end date, but it gives you an idea. Well, thank you, That's, that'll be helpful. Yeah. All right, any other questions? So I'll just, close with I really want to help you all do the best that you can do like it's not um my job is to enable you all to do your job so that the youth get the best care that they can so if there's anything that I can do uh any you know doors I can open up or walls I can knock down let me know I'm pretty good at doing that stuff who knew it was a gift so there you go <laughs> I think it's because I'm little 
you can't tell so much, but I'm kind of little and I can sneak in. <laughs> That's how I used to play basketball. I was little, I could sneak underneath people. <laughs> all right. So you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you for spending your time with me. And uh, yeah, I'll send out a link to the recording that you can share with your colleagues in ministry. So then maybe they don't have to come to a conference call. Thank right. you, Terry. Thank you, Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.